Okay, so today I'm going to talk about writing a solver for a game called Ricochet Robots. This is a board game. I've got a couple copies. If you want to come and play after, find me in the hallway. We'll set up a table somewhere and play. Super fun game. So why would I want to talk about writing a solver for this game? Really, I wanted a solver for the game because we play it at work all the time and we never know if we've got the best solutions. And of course, the best way to do a side project is to propose a conference talk about it and then get accepted and then madly write the solver and the talk about it all at the same time. That's the best way to get a side project done, right? But really, what, what I'm going to be talking about is some uh, computer science-y stuff, um, graph search algorithms and things like that. I learned this stuff back in, in college, but not everybody knows this stuff. We had a local Ruby users group meetup where we were working on maze solvers, um, which use very similar algorithms. And very few people knew these algorithms. So I thought it was worth talking about, and the game is a fun way to do that. So why do we care about graphs and graph search algorithms? They're actually, graphs are a very common data structure in when you're modeling business organizations. Actually, in a Rails app I'm working on, we just had a problem where we needed to use graphs and a couple of these algorithms to solve a problem we had. Relationship maps, like you know your LinkedIn connections, because I'm sure you all have LinkedIn connections or Facebook, social, any kind of social network. That's a graph structure. Uh, travel planning, trip planning, network routing. All of these things use these kind of data structures and these kind of algorithms. Obviously much more complex than the ones I'm going to talk about, but still they're, they're important. So it's good to know about this stuff. So what is Ricochet Robots? As I said, it's a board game. You have a 16 by 16 grid of cells. Uh, there's these colored target cells on there. And you have a set of five robots distributed around the board. And the idea is you pick a, there's actually 17 little disks with, with the goal symbols on them. And you go through them in order, in a random order, sorry. And the idea is you have to get the proper colored robot into the goal cell. So in this case, we're looking for the green square cell. And we need to somehow move the green robot into that cell. Now the robots can only move in straight lines and they can't stop unless they hit something. So you have to run into a wall or another robot before you can stop and change directions. So I'll, what's that? Yeah, somebody called seven. And so you can move any number of robots, and so everybody stares at the board and figures out how many moves it would take them to solve this, calls it out, whoever gets the best answer within a certain amount of time gets to go. So here's an example solution. We're gonna move the blue robot first, and then we're gonna chase the green robot around after it, bounce off the blue robot, and down into the goal cell. That's how the game works. And if you're like me, you can immediately say, hey, I want to write a solver for this, because it seems like you should be able to do this, right? But before you embark on writing a solver like this, you need to kind of characterize the problem and decide, you know, just what am I dealing with here? So first of all, what's the size of the problem space? There's 256 cells. Four of them are already take, always taken up by that center island. So there's 252 cells and five robots. That means there's 976 and a half billion possible board states, different positions of all the robots. That's a pretty big search space. The other complicating factor is the branching factor. From each board state, there are anywhere from nine to 20 possible moves. Um, you know, four, five robots, four possible directions, that's 20. Sometimes they're in corners, sometimes one is just moved in a certain direction, so it could be as few as nine. That's a pretty wide branching factor. And because there's so many states, you have to think about how am I going to represent this board in memory? You don't want to take up too much memory if you're going to have a lot of states in play at any one time. So I studied the board a little bit and thought about it. The grid itself is fixed. It's always this grid with the center island. That's static. You really only need to represent that one time. At the next level are the walls and targets. You can actually have a bunch of different board configurations, but for the duration of one game, this is fixed as well. So you really only need one copy while you're solving the game. A little more variable are what's the goal? What, what target are we shooting for right now? That changes once per turn, but it's still relatively static. And then there's the robot positions, and those change all the time. So in the solver I wrote, I ended up representing a board state as a combination of the goal cell and the robot positions, and that's how I represented it. Okay, you also have to represent robot movement, and in this case, the board states are the nodes in the tree, and each edge of the tree is the movement of one robot in a certain direction, so the red one moving left or right or whatever. So you hopefully you get the idea. So what is a tree? A tree is a fairly common data structure in computer science. Um, you have nodes, which are I'm representing as boards here, 
and edges, the lines between them. And to make it a tree, every node has at most one parent. Okay, so the root node at the top doesn't have any parents. Every other node in the tree has exactly one parent, and that's what makes it a tree. You can have any number of children, but one parent. Okay, and when you have trees, you generally need to search through them, and that's where search algorithms comes in. If you want a really accessible introduction to search algorithms, uh, see Jameis's book that he, he just wrote. Um, I read it when he was writing it on his blog, and it's awesome. Um, very good, accessible. He's talking about maze solvers, but the algorithms are very similar, like I said earlier. So I highly recommend that. And Jameis is speaking tomorrow, so I'm guessing he's going to be talking about some of the same stuff. So highly recommend it. So the first search algorithm I'm going to talk about is kind of one of the most basic ones. It's called the depth first search. And in a depth first search, you search all the way down one branch of the tree, and then you back up and try a different branch. So that ends up looking like this, where we go all the way down to the bottom of the tree, back up and over, up and over. And that's a depth first search. Okay. Very simple algorithm to program. It's a recursive algorithm. Um, so I've got the solve method where I'm taking an initial state, solving recursively. And as I'm solving, I'm building up the list of candidate solutions. And then I find the shortest solution, and that's my answer. Um, the recursive solution, you just look at the path. Is it a solution? If it is, put it on the list of candidates, return. Otherwise, find all the successor paths. All right. Is that dead? All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so you generate all the successor paths and put them, or then solve each of those recursively, and that's a depth first search. Now, in this solver, I started out solving for a single robot, just because that was uh, an easier problem to work from. And the first problem you run into is the idea of a cycle. So you can get a robot up in the corner here, and it starts going around in circles. So you have to guard against that. You want to make sure that you don't end up in an infinite loop because you'll never find your solution. So you can think of maybe, well, let's keep track of all the board states that we've seen before and not process those again. But the problem with that is that you can sometimes get to the same cell via two different paths. So here I've, on the left, I've got a board where it took four moves to get to that cell. And on the right, a path where it only took three moves to get to the cell. And if my goal is that green circle, I've got one more move to go. If I, if I start with the board on the left, and then I, I find I got to the same cell I've been in before, I throw that away, and I just miss my shortest path. So I haven't actually found an optimal solution. So what you find is that this nice little tree I showed you is not really a tree at all. It's actually a graph where nodes have multiple parents. So in this graph, I've got a, two, a length two path to the same node and a length one path. So you have to watch for that. The other complication is that these algorithms I'm talking about are designed to find the optimal shortest solution. But in the rules of ricochet robots, there are some short solutions that are not legal. For example, if the robot starts on the goal cell already, that's not a legal solution. You have to leave and go back. Or if you start one move away, that's not legal either. You have to actually ricochet once before you get to the goal cell. So here, the best solution is to go left, down, right, up. Now I'm back where I just started. That looks like a cycle, right? Except that because that first move was not a legal move, I have to not count this as a cycle. So it's a little bit tricky. And then I move into the goal cell. That's actually the shortest solution for that board. So there's ways to solve all of these. Um, but really, this is a bad algorithm, because if you, if you have to search all the way to the bottom of the tree, you have to search the whole tree, the whole state space, in order to find the shortest solution. And with 976 and a half billion states, no, we're not doing that. We don't have time. So we need a better algorithm. So the next algorithm I'll talk about is one called a breadth-first search. And in a breadth-first search, instead of working down the branches of the tree, you work across the levels of the tree. And that, so that looks like this. So we look at the zero move solutions, then one move, then two moves, and then three moves. The nice thing about this algorithm is it's guaranteed to find the shortest solution first, because you're always looking one move, then two, then three, then four, and so on. So that's nice. So the code ends up looking like this, and you use a queue to help you implement this. So I put the initial path on the queue, 
And then I pull the first one off the queue. If it's a solution, I return it. I'm done. I don't need to search any of the rest of the tree. Otherwise, you put the successor states all on the end of the list and you move on. So with this algorithm, we can actually use a global visited list that didn't work with the depth first search um, because if we get to a state we've already seen before, we're guaranteed that we got there faster the first time, or at least as fast anyway. So that's a nice optimization. We don't have to process states multiple times like we did with depth first search. But even with this, this was not fast enough. This can't solve all the boards fast enough, so it's time to optimize. The global visited list is one form of optimization, but really there's three kinds of optimizations we can do. One is to do less things. We want to somehow try to reduce this, the size of the search space. Another is to do things faster, and this is what most people think of with performance optimization, where you're just trying to speed things up, speed up your code, make it run faster, run a, run a profiler, just less work per state. With search algorithms, there's a third thing you can do, and that's introduce heuristics, which are basically rules of thumb. The thing about heuristics is that unlike the previous two optimizations, which are very objective and work all the time, heuristics don't always work, and they, they kind of some, some states it may work, some it may not, and so they're, they're much more variable. Often you can find good ones that work most of the time, but they don't always work, and so you have to be careful with them. So when I was working on, on my solver, the first optimization I tried was actually heuristic. And I was thinking about the game, and the last move you make is always to move the active robot into the goal cell. So why don't we try a heuristic where we always check the active robot first? Because when we get to the level where we're going to find a solution, we'll find the solution fastest by moving the active robot first. So I tried that. What this graph represents is all 17 turns in a game. Um, there's several places where the two lines coincide, and that's because they both move the same robot first. Most of the time, the red line with the triangles, which is with the heuristic in place, is a little bit below the blue line, so it most of the time helps. But there's that one outlier out to the right edge where it was way worse. And I don't know why it was like that, but this kind of illustrates the point that heuristics don't always work. Um, I kept this heuristic in place because overall it seems to be a win. I need to analyze it a little more to make sure it really is a, enough of a win. But it did kind of skew my results a little bit because of that one outlier. So then I started moving on to more objective optimizations. And I realized that I was processing way too many states. You remember the algorithm I showed you earlier? We check a path for whether it's a solution when we pull it off the front of the queue. But what if instead we checked it before we even put it on the queue in the first place? So originally, to find a solution at node 16 here, I had to search all 16 nodes. But if I change my code to look like this, where I generate the successors, and then I check whether any of those is a solution before I put them on the end of the list, what happens is I can find the solution at node 16 when I'm processing node 6. So I've knocked 10 nodes off, of, off the search here. And you can imagine with a branching factor of 9 to 20 at each level, and you get down 8 or 9 moves in the tree, this is a pretty big savings. And it turns out it was. This is the number of states that I had to consider to find a solution for my example game. And it was almost a factor of 3 improvement, a re reduction in number of states considered. So doing a lot less things. And that sped things up quite a bit. Then I started running a profiler, and the next thing I found is that most of my time was being spent trying to figure out where the robot was going to stop, because I had a really dumb algorithm. I was just going, can I move? Can I move? Can I move? Can I move? Oh, i got to stop there. And that was where all the time was going. And so what I did is I pre-computed the stopping cells for the robots. So for each cell on the board and for each of the four directions, figure out if I move that direction, where am I going to stop? And, and I didn't consider other robots in this pre-computation. And this is a classic trade-off that you make in optimization a lot, where I needed to use extra storage space to store these pre-computed cells, but it made the algorithm much faster. So I was trading space for time. And that is a classic optimization technique. Um, even in your Rails apps, database indexes, you have to take up extra storage space to store the index, but it speeds up your queries drastically, so you're trading space for time. Very common optimization technique. And as you can see, this sped things up. This is the number of states I'm processing in a second. And it was a pretty good jump without optimization. Um, then I did a little bit of research, and I found another talk by Michael Fogelman where he was writing a ricochet robot solver. 
And he made the observation that there are some board states that are equivalent even though they don't look like it. So here's two boards. The robots are in exactly the same positions, but it's different robots in those positions. If I'm solving for the green robot, it's in the same place. I don't really care what color the other robots are. It just doesn't matter because I can bounce off the red robot or the blue robot to get where I'm going. I don't care. And so I was able to implement uh, what I call a board state equivalence class that, that treated these two board states as equivalent. And that was a slight improvement, a few less states to consider. Um, but also in order to implement that, I came up with a more concise representation of a, of, of a board state equivalence that was faster to compare. So I actually ended up doing things faster at the same time and I was able to process more states per second. So sometimes the optimizations you do are gonna have both reduce the amount of work you have to do and speed things up. The board state equivalence class I implemented, I implemented as a set of position representations and I realized that the set comparison was taking long, a long time and so I switched over to a sorted array instead, which is actually faster to compare, another slight speed up. The next thing I found was that I was creating a lot of unnecessary objects. Every time I tried to move a robot, whether it moved or not, I created a new board state that I would then have to compare. And so I, I stopped creating new states when the robot wasn't actually gonna move. If I'm up against a wall and I try to move, I'm not going anywhere. Why create a new state for that? That was a huge win. So definitely creating less objects is another good optimization technique. And finally, I found some places where I could compare objects by identity rather than a deep equality. And that was another speed up. Now, this solver is actually pretty good, um, but it's not good enough yet. There's still some places where it's slow, but at some point I had to stop working on the solver and actually put together some slides for this talk so that I actually had something to talk about. So this is still a work in progress, but it's pretty good. So here's where I ended up with the optimizations I did. Um, this is the total solving time for the example game I was running. And you can see it sped up quite a bit. Those first couple of algorithms were pretty naive and pretty slow. And with these optimizations I just talked about, it sped up quite a bit. So let me show you a quick demo of the solver in action. It's very text-based. And I'm running an example that I know how fast it runs. I stole a, a, a trick from Minitest, thank you, Ryan, where I print out the, the random number seed that was used so I can feed it back in and run the exact same game over and over again. That was great for testing this, so it's a great trick. So let me just run the solver. This is gonna be playing an entire 17 move game by itself. I can guarantee you I cannot play the game this fast. So blue square is a little bit of a slower one. I think it's actually a nine move solution. There we go. About 30 seconds to play an entire game of Ricochet Robots. So like I said, there's still some board states where it's not quite that fast, but it's pretty good. So how else might I improve this thing? Well, obviously I could try some better algorithms. There's a very famous algorithm called A star. It's kind of like the breadth first search I just showed you, but it's actually more of a, what's called a best first search. And what it does is when you have a list of states to consider, instead of just choosing the one that has the shortest distance traveled so far, it adds in a factor which is an estimate of how much further there is to go. And as long as that estimate is never an overestimate, as long as I always estimate low, then A star actually comes up with an optimal solution. So the way that would, might work, we'd have to come up with some, some way of, of coming up with an estimate of how far there is to go. And I got this idea from Michael Fogelman's talk as well. You can kind of, you can compute. If the robots could stop anywhere where they wanted to, how many moves would it take them to get to the goal? So obviously if you're already at the goal, that's a zero. Anything in a straight line is a one. Anything in a straight line from there is a two, and then threes, and fours, and in this board, five. So from those cells marked five, even if the robots could stop anywhere they want, it would take five moves to get into the goal cell from there, just because of the structure of the board and where the walls are. So that's actually a pretty good estimation function for how many moves there are to go. And so the way the algorithm would work is, let's say I've got one board state where I've already made four moves, but I estimate one more to get into the goal. 
And I've got another state where I've only made two moves, but I estimate five more to get to the goal. Well, four plus one is less than, what did I say, two plus five. So I would actually consider that state where I've already made four moves first. I would try that one first. And this actually should speed things up a little bit. I haven't tried this one yet. It's probably my next one to try. But that's A star in a nutshell. Um, maybe collision detection algorithms for figuring out when robots are going to run into each other or into walls. Maybe that would be an optimization. I haven't tried that yet. That's an idea. Another thought is to take a different approach and maybe work backwards. So you look at the goal cell and then figure out where's all the possible places I could stop before I get into the goal and then work back from there. Maybe that would be a better algorithm. I don't know. I kind of use this one when I play a fair bit. I kind of work backwards a little bit. Whether that works for a computer or not, I'm not sure. You could also try some better heuristics. For example, most solutions only involve two, maybe three robots. So what if we always move the most recently moved robot first and try that? Maybe things would be a little bit faster. Or maybe some combination of moving the active robot and the most recently used robot. Um, maybe we could be smarter about which directions we explore first. Like maybe from this state, moving left is, more, is, is likely to be better than moving up or down. And so we, we choose more intelligently that way. What my profiler is telling me right now is that the slowest part of my algorithm is figuring out whether I'm going to run into another robot. So I've got the pre-computed stopping points with the walls, but that doesn't factor in where the robots are at that time because they move a lot more frequently. So the pre-computation didn't seem like it would pay off as well. But maybe I could pre-compute per robot stopping positions. So that's an option. Could always try to use less objects and more primitive types. You know, sometimes creating a lot of objects is really slow, and if you could use primitives, things would go faster. Then there's always the ever popular throw more hardware at it parallelize things, process states in parallel and see if we can find an algorithm faster. So those are just some of the ideas of where I'm going to go with this next. Maybe you've got some ideas for how this could be optimized. Um, love to hear about them. I want to thank a few people. Um, Trevor Yarish, who's one of the founders at Zeo and also one of our designers, did all the design work on these slides and I think he did a beautiful job. The animations were, he did those. Um, so I'm very thankful to, for, to Trevor for the time he put in. The other guys at Zeal paired with me on the solver a little bit, gave me ideas and feedback, so thank you to them. I mentioned Michael Fogelman a couple times. His talk was really interesting, so I got some neat ideas from there. And Trevor Lalish Manaz, is the guy who introduced me to this game at Ruby Decamp a couple years ago, and so I thank him very much because I love playing the game. It's a lot of fun. The code for my solver is up on GitHub. I'm going to keep working on it, but if you want to play with it, feel free to fork it and play with it. And I've got a few minutes for some questions if anybody has questions. All right, thank you very much.